Okay, um, welcome everybody to uh, RESTful API, API Design with Spring. Uh, my name is Ben Hale, and my day job is that I am the, uh, the lead of the Cloud Foundry Java experience. Um, now, many of you uh, here are probably asking yourself, why exactly is someone having to do with cloud computing talking about RESTful APIs? And the answer is, I'm not actually here to talk to you about cloud computing. Um, so, so uh, you know, relax about that. But what I am going to talk to you guys about is sort of my experience over the past couple of years designing RESTful APIs for applications that I've written and looking at the APIs that people have written that run on top of Cloud Foundry. And so, any discussion of RESTful APIs requires us to start by understanding exactly what REST is, right? REST, the acronym, stands for Representational State Transfer. Um, and I know a lot of you are not native English speakers, but as a native English speaker, that doesn't make any sense to me either, right? It's very, very difficult to understand. But fundamentally, when you boil it down, what you're talking about is an architectural style for designing distributed systems, right? So the concept of REST sort of uh, came about um, in Roy Fielding's uh, doctoral dissertation. And in that dissertation, he talked about, you know, the internet, right? How to design systems that run on the internet things where the systems may not be able to communicate to one another intermittently, that they may not exactly know what version of something is ru uh, running at the other end of a connection. So what he laid down was not a standard. What he laid down was sort of a set of constraints, right? This idea that connections on the internet should be client-server, right? They should be stateless. This is really important. We'll see a little bit later. They should have a uniform interface, and there are some things that go beyond that, right? And so he talked about it in the context of HTTP, and being as Fielding was one of the authors of the original HTTP spec, many people can, you know, sort of assume that REST is an HTTP thing, but it turns out that it's not actually, right? Um, it's associated most commonly with it, but it really has to do with almost, you know, anything. You can technically do REST over JMS if you wanted to, for example. And so one of the, the, the key components to that idea of REST is this, call, this idea of a uniform interface. And uh, we, we, I quote from the, uh, the, the great uh, Pirates of the Caribbean movie, we're talking more about guidelines than actual rules here, right? This is not something that's absolutely set in stone. And there's a great laugh line here because you can say, yeah, the application I just wrote was RESTful. The application that you just wrote is RESTful. All applications are fundamentally RESTful because it's impossible not to be, right? There are no rules that define what makes something RESTful. So what you end up with is a continuum of restfulness. And you, know, you can say that that isn't particularly restful. This is very restful, something like that. But really, everybody's doing it to some level. The question is how far you've gone exactly. So the uniform uh, interface in HTTP consists of a couple of pieces. First is the identification of resources, then how you manipulate those resources, making sure that the messages that are transferred between the client and server to do these things, to manipulate these resources, are self-descriptive. And then we've got this giant sentence at the bottom, hypermedia as the engine of application state. I'm going to skip over that one right now because we're going to talk about it in great detail in the middle of the, uh, in the, middle of the session here. So HTTP's uniform interface uses URIs to identify resources. Everybody in here has seen a URI at the very least. We're going to see that they uniquely identify one particular resource somewhere on the internet. The HTTP verbs describe that limited set of operations that we can do on a resource. And so we see get, delete, post, put, the most common four, the original four in HTTP. There are other lesser view, um, used verbs. We see things like options and head. And then as we extend, there are you know, extensions to the HTTP spec, such as webdab, that describe things like patch and, and other verbs as well. But for the purposes of this talk, we're going to talk about the big four, right? the one that we see everybody using all of the time. Then finally, if we remember from the previous slide, we're going to use headers to self-describe messages. We're going to see how headers can be used to say, this is what I'm giving you, or this is what I want to receive from you. So the first verb, 
And I go over these in, in pretty great detail because there's a lot of misconceptions about what each one of these verbs mean. Um, if you haven't read the HTTP spec and are at all interested in it, it's really, really easy to read, right? It's probably the easiest spec you're ever going to read. Um, and it really, when you, when you go over it, when you sort of sit down and think about it, um, you find out that there are a lot of misconceptions that, you know, very smart people have about what each one of the verbs in it mean. So a get must retrieve some information, right? Everybody pretty much knows that. Must be safe and idempotent. Now, idempotent is another one of those horrible English words that no one really knows what it means. But what it basically means is if you do it repeatedly, you should get the same answer back from it each time. Now, here is where people really have some misconceptions. Most people think that a get cannot have any side effects. And that's true to a point. Get can actually have side effects, but since the user doesn't sort of expect them to happen, they expect, you know, get to return this information to be idempotent so they to get the same result every time, they shouldn't be critical to the operation of the system. So an example of this is something like if I call get, right, and my application then logs an audit trail, right? It puts something in a database that says somebody just called get, right? And then there's another HTTP endpoint that I can go pull that audit log. The fact that I've done a get does actually have a side effect, right? There is another resource that is changed because I've called get. But here's, you know, sort of this gray area where we say, well, it's not actually critical to the system. It hasn't changed what a user should expect to happen when they, when they call get. So those kind of side effects are fine. Bigger side effects, calling get to create an instance of something, you know, that's, that's obviously, you know, a no-no. We've got other verbs that do those kinds of things. One of the really great bits of the get verb, though, is that it can be conditional or partial. There are two headers that you can use, um, and there are many headers certainly beyond this, but the two that are most commonly used are something called if modified since, where you can basically say, if the resource has changed since this time, please send it to me again. Otherwise, just tell me it's the same. And you can even ask for a range of something, right? So if you know that something is 10 megabytes long, you might have already downloaded five megs and your, your download had failed for some reason. You can download the last five without going through the first five again. The delete verb, another really simple one, request that a resource be removed and a misconception here that a lot of people have, the resource doesn't actually have to be removed immediately, right? Instead, removal may be a long-running task. And in that case, you may, instead of saying, okay, I have deleted something, which is sort of a typical answer, you may say that, yes, I accept your request for deletion, and I'll let you know when it's done, and I'll tell you how to find that out. So remember that delete is not necessarily instantaneously. If it's a long-running task, the last thing you want to do is hold open an HTTP connection for a couple of minutes or days, potentially, if that's what it takes to delete something. So we want to make sure that we remember that. The next one is put. Okay? Put. Lots of misconceptions about put. Put fundamentally says that when I pass you an entity, I want you to store that entity at the particular URI. So it can be used for a number of different things. Obviously, if I give you a complete entity, it could be used to create a brand new entity. Or potentially, if I give you that entity, it may be used to change the entity that already exists at the resource, right? So it's a way for me to say, in this particular case, we see some examples up there, and it says, this door, door number two, I want you to change it to selected, right? Now, when we say that put can be used to create new entities, it's very, very rare that you see that. Most RESTful APIs won't support that particular endpoint because it basically allows an external client to arbitrarily choose what URL a resource will be exposed at, right? If this door, uh, Games 1, Doors 2 didn't exist and I posted it there, that's it. I got to pick it, not the system. So in most cases, we see put only allowing modification, not allowing creation. But that's okay. It's got another verb that does creation, but it also does a whole lot more, right? So post, this is the one we've all seen when it comes to HTML forms, right? Um, the most common way to use it. But it turns out it's so much better than just that. It requests that an entity at a particular URI, in this case the games URI, do something, but doesn't say what that something is. And that's really, really critical. Basically the 
the, the HTTP designers gave us a get out of jail free card. They said, there's this verb, and it might typically be used to create something or modify something, but that's not all it does. It can do anything you want. And that's really, really powerful because many of the questions people have when they talk about designing a RESTful API are how do I do verb X, right? Clearly, get, delete, post, put doesn't cover all the things your business needs to do in an application. But how do we do all of those things? And almost always, the answer is with a post. The major difference between put and post, since they seem very similar, are who's doing what, right? Who's doing this thing that you're actually requesting us to do? Or is the entity itself, right? Is the resource that you're, you're, you're calling for a put, is that going to be the thing that does this work? Or are you going to call someone else who acts sort of as an actor on behalf of you and does something throughout the system? So those are sort of the things you think about when you decide, should I do post on this? Should I do put on this? What exactly am I doing? Am I creating? Am I updating? Am I doing a third thing that is neither of those? Who should do this work? So we're going to do a lot of live coding today. And it's all centered around a particular demo application. Let's make a deal. That's what it is in America. Um, I'm not sure you guys ever got this uh, TV show here. I hope you didn't. It's not great. <laughs> but it illustrates a, uh, a particular style of game. So imagine you're up, you're, you're on stage, right, and on one of these giant TV game shows. And there are three doors. You got a host next to you. And he goes, okay, so I want you to select one of these doors, right? Behind them, there's either a small furry animal or great prizes for you. You don't know which prize is yet, right? So he says, OK, we've got three doors. I want you just to select one of those doors. OK? So we're going to select door number one for zero index. And he says, OK, before we open that door, I'm going to ask you, or I'm going to show you what's behind one of those other doors, right? What do we have? Small furry animal. My, uh, my little cat, Loki. I always love, you know, the, the god of mischief in my demos. I'm sure nothing will go wrong, right? <laughs> And so now he says, OK, now that you know what's behind door number zero, I'm going to give you a chance. You can change your mind. Do you want to open that door you selected? Or do you want to open a different door? Right? You want to open the other one. And incredibly, there is a right answer to this. Does anybody know what the right answer is? Change it. Absolutely. There's 50 years worth of math <laughs> that proves that your best chance at this point is to actually open the other door, the one you didn't select. And when we do, look at what's behind it. An awesome bicycle, right? It's my bicycle. Absolutely love it, right? So we've won this particular game. This is what we're going to be taking a look at when we write our code today. So if we break that down into sort of the interaction model through our RESTful API, right? What are we going to do? We need to create a game. We need to list the current state of all the doors, whether they're sort of closed, whether they're opened, whether they're selected. We need, to select, we need to find out those. We need to then select one of the doors. Keep that in mind, because that certainly doesn't look like one of the verbs we've seen. The game's going to open one of the non-bicycle doors for us, because it'd be a really crappy game if they opened the winning door. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then the user will open one of the remaining two doors, will list the outcome of the game, whether they've won or lost, and then we want to do a little bit of cleanup at the end. So how do we create that game? Well, when it comes to designing an API like this, right, we want to make sure that we've got a, well, a single well-known entry point. Why is this? Well, one of the key components to a good API design like this is to decouple the client and the server. Ideally, that means that we give the client a single URL. This is the single endpoint that you need to know about our server. And with that information, you'll be able to get to every other URL and do every other thing that you need to do, right? <clears throat> We're going to see how exactly that works a little bit later. But, so we've got our well-known entry point. We want to post to game doesn't require any input other than the fact that a game is being created. So the post doesn't actually have to take any data. We're used to it doing that, right, when you submit a form or something like that. It's not a requirement. We just want to say, you slash games, do something for me. And then finally, it needs to provide a resource identifier of that newly created game. Right? We need to know, once the game has been created, where it is. How do we play, right? <clears throat> the next thing. 
lists the current state of a given door. So we need to be able to ask a particular door, one of these resources, what is your current state? We're going to say slash game, slash zero, slash door, slash one, get that, and get a payload back. We're going to use JSON today, um, sort of is the hot, sexy data payload at the moment. XML works. You could do it in a compressed binary format if you want to. Not tied to REST, just easy to read, easy to demo here today. One of the keys that we're going to see in our design, and this is something that trips a lot of people up, is we don't actually design in a door one, door two, door three. What we have is a collection of doors. Since each door is uniquely identified by its URI, right, this idea that a URI represents a unique resource, a unique and completely, you know, separate resource on the, in, on the entire internet. Because of that, it means that we don't have to identify one, two, and three. As long as we can always say that when a user has selected something in our user interface, we know where to go on the internet to signal some information about that, it's good enough. <clears throat> Next thing we need to do is select a door, right? So how do we do that? There is no HTTP verb for select, right? What we do, and this is probably the biggest, the biggest hurdle for people to jump over when designing for REST, is this idea that there are verbs, and what I want to do doesn't match to a verb, so how do I get that done? And in almost every single case, the answer is to say, what exactly was that verb trying to do? What was the state change we were trying to achieve, right? And in our particular case, we're trying to take the status of a door and change it from closed to selected. And if we remember back, put allows us to modify a particular thing, right? A particular entity. And so in this particular case, what we're going to say is we're going to put to one of these doors a change status selected. It may go through a hundred different statuses before there, but what I'm saying is I want this thing to change, and the server decides what a change means. So in our particular case, when we change one of the doors to select it, that also causes the server to go back and change one of the other two doors to open for us, right? Finally, we need to open one of the final two doors. Like select, we want to represent a mutation. And again, since we're more or less using the same type of resource, we can use the exact same payload, right? Instead of saying status selected, we say status opened. Same kind of thing, right? Now, it's obvious that there are times when saying um, status opened, like when the game has first started, you don't get to just open a game. So it's not like put will always honor the request you've made. We'll see what, how, you, how you tell the client that, you know, as a server, I'm not going to do what you just asked me to do. But in the end, what we're trying to do is signal a change of some kind. List the final state of the game. We're going to do another get for this. Need to return an object that represents that particular state. And then finally, we're going to destroy the game. No input, no output. Just need to make sure we do a little cleanup at the end. So let's take a look at some code. <clears throat> Grab a drink here. You'll have to bear with me a little bit. I am a um, recent IDE changer, so uh, some of these keystrokes will go horribly wrong, I'm pretty sure. So we're going to start with, actually, rather than starting with the controller, why don't we start a little bit lower down? Why don't we start by taking a look at the data types, right? So we've got this game here. And the game internally, I represent it all. It sort of drops back into a JPA database, but is exactly what you sort of think. It's got an ID, and it's got a status, OK? It's what a game looks like. We've got a, a door inside as well. It's got an ID. It's got some content inside of it. Um, we want to obfuscate the content because there are certain times when we don't actually want to know what it is, uh, exactly what its status is, who its owner is. We see, you know, we've got a little enum here that says what the content might be, what the status might be inside of it. We access all of this through a um, Doran game repository. If you guys haven't seen this, it, the talk here is not 
entirely supposed to be, you know, here's cool new features that Spring 4 provides for you. But I'll touch on a little of them because they're, they're pretty cool. Um, what we're looking at here is something called Spring Data JPA. And if you haven't heard of it, it basically allows you to define an interface, and that's it. And uh, Spring Data JPA will come along behind the scenes and write all of the code you need to implement that, right? So a game repository, if we take a look at some of the things that it might do for us, um, it'll be grayed out up there, but you can see all the different deletes, find alls, and stuff like that. Not that hard, right? You could write something with generics that does that. But what's really cool is in the fact that you can define just a new method that doesn't exist already, find all by game. And it knows how to parse that out and say, oh, you want to find all of the doors by a particular game. And behind the scenes, it writes all of the JQL queries. It makes sure it turns it into the proper types and does all the type mappings and stuff like that. And you never write any code. And the best code is no code, right? It means there's never going to be a bug in it. Or if there is, it's you know, sort of in the framework and gets fixed by somebody else that's not you, right? <clears throat> so that's how we get the data in and out, but how about, how does the game actually get played? Standard game service. Actually, I should check out the game service first. The game service, simple implementation, has a create, delete, open a door, select a door, right? And if we take a look at an implementation of that, um, maybe it's this set of keys. Ah, yes. Um, we see that it uses that game and door repository. Uh, we see it uses save and flush to, you know, to, to create all of these things. It's all transactional to make sure that good things happen. Apparently, already have a breakpoint on this <laughs> for some reason. Um, uh, and this is probably the biggest one, right? Um, if we take a look at the select implementation right here, we find out what it is. We open one of the hint doors instead. Come in. We have when we open it, we have to decide whether we've won or lost. So, not particularly interesting, but how the game is implemented. The really interesting stuff is in the controllers, because we're here to implement a RESTful API. So uh, starting in Spring 4, um, uh, we have a couple new features, right? Um, how many of you guys have implemented a Spring controller already? Have used like at request mapping? Okay, so a lot of you guys will, will know this. Um, I'll touch on the, the bits of it that are specifically new to Spring 4 to give you an idea. Um, everybody's pretty familiar with controller, right? Controller basically comes in, um, Spring knows to look around on the class path and say, hey, are you a controller? Yes, I need to map you so that you listen to a particular endpoint and everything like that, and then I'm going to route things to you, and then I'm going to convert things back and forth. But if you use at controller, one of the, the it's, it's good flexibility, let's say, and that is that what you return typically indicates a view that you want to render, right? But if we're in REST land, most of the time we don't want to render a view, right? We want the object that we return to actually be turned directly into a JSON payload, XML payload, something like that. So starting in Spring 4, we've introduced REST controller instead. And this basically, for those of you who have deep understanding of what, uh, <laughs> what exactly um, uh, Spring is doing behind the scenes, is, it is implicitly also tagging everything with response body. Right. And response body is simply Spring's way of saying, you know the return value from this thing? I want you to make sure that it gets, this is the body that we send back. This is not you requesting a view to be rendered or something. Right. So we've said that this is a REST controller, so implicitly marks every single one of our methods as at response body, so we'll get automatic conversion for us. And now we want to describe what exactly this endpoint should look like. So at request mapping, um, by default, it's get, uh, the request method there is. Um, you'll find that I'm actually a little bit more verbose than you absolutely need to be. And the reason is I like the way something like this reads. I like to say that the method should equal uh, request method post and value. The endpoint should be nothing. So if we, if we remember from request mapping at the top of a class, that basically means the URL should start slash games and have nothing on the other side of it. And when that happens, we should uh, get um, this method particularly called, right? The next thing we need to do, 
read the status of a game. So we'll take a look at this guy. Anybody remember what, uh, what method we're, we're supposed to do here? If we want to read the, the game? Get, yeah, so we'll do a request method dot, oops. And the value equals, um, how about this, slash game. So what are we looking at here? Slash dollar, cur or dollar, sorry, slash curly braces game. In Spring's parlance, this is what's called a path variable, right? And a path variable is simply a way to say inside a URL, this is an interesting segment that I can reference. And I think most of us have probably used um, path variables before. But almost exclusively, the way we use them is by saying path variable, integer, game ID, something like that. And then we go this dot game repository, which I haven't even repository dot get by ID, game ID. And assign that to whatever, right? Assign it to. Right. Since you got to do that every single time, yeah, it pretty much sucks, right? So what I want my implementation to do is say, you know, the thing that Spring uses, because obviously when this comes in, it's a string. So string knows, or sorry, so Spring already knows how to convert that from a string into an integer, right? Because otherwise this wouldn't work. But man, wouldn't it be nice if I could just say that, right? Just inject me the game. Right? I don't want to have to do all of this boilerplate. And so Spring Data JPA does this for us. When we, when we uh, added Spring Data JPA into the system, there's a little annotation that you can put on. Uh, let me find where that is. Application configuration, Spring Data Web Support. And it registers a whole pile of stuff behind the scenes, tons and tons of beans. But the key bean is the one we just looked at, right? Is this one that knows how to say, oh, you need to convert from that string, which is an ID, back to a game. Then we can just basically assert that the game is not null, so you've requested a game that actually exists, uh, and we'll return it. We'll see a little bit more about this resource assembler in a moment. Uh, the final one that we want to do here, at request mapping method equals, anybody remember what the method is for this? Yeah, delete, the easiest one, right? And Good, so an implementation there. Um, because this is a good application, if I run all of the tests now, we should see, well, I should have done it firsthand, really. Um, you would have seen that there were some failing tests, and hopefully we'll see some continuing to fail tests, because we haven't done everything. Um, you'd see that the number of failures had actually gotten slightly smaller. Uh, so we're looking at eight failures, which is down from nine. All right, so this is how we do implementations like this. Cannot seem to press that button. <clears throat> so, we've seen how to implement a request coming in, but how do we tell the, the caller exactly what's happened, right? Because in most cases, a caller is going to behave well, and they're going to say, yeah, I need you to create this for me, I need you to select this at the appropriate time, I need you to open this at the appropriate time, I need to call delete later on to clean it up, but they don't always, right? So server needs to be able to indicate back to the client exactly what has happened. And so we see HTTP status codes, um, broadly defined into five categories, 100s for informational, which you very rarely see, 200s for success, 300s for redirection, 400s for something the client has done wrong, and 500s for something the server has done wrong. So 200, everybody loves a 200, everything worked. 201 created one that a lot of people don't use, right? But it makes sense for us to use this. When a game is created, the game has to communicate back to the original client how to find it, right? How to go get its status. And so rather than saying, okay, you know, I've done what you've asked me to, we say, no, not only have we done what you've asked us to, we've created something for you. And then using the location header, 
we tell the original caller exactly where to go to find this particular resource, right? Go back to here to get this. 202, another interesting one. This goes back to that idea that a delete might take a while. A create could take a while too, for example. Modification might take a while. Is this idea, instead of saying, okay, I'm done, I can say, yes, I've accepted your request, and I'm going to go do some work. Imagine if this is an endpoint that kicks off a multi-day batch job, right? You know, that does some sort of, you know, they call it, I guess it's not real-time analysis, maybe offline analysis or something like that, you know, to find out, uh, you know, the NSA runs this to find out who's spying on who or, you know, more likely who's not spying on who these days. Um, accept it, right? Once again, we're going to use that location header. But this time, rather than saying, here's where to go find the resource that I've just created, what it's actually going to say is, here's where to go to find out what my current status is. So you do sort of a task-based um, process here, where we say, um, you've asked me to do something, I've accepted that request, and if you go here, just sort of pull at it, you'll find out when I'm finally done. So are these success status codes. Client error status codes, a couple pages of these, 400 bad requests, malform syntax, and this is the key, sort of the second line of all of these is, is the key bit. Um, 400 indicates to you as a client, because we all have to implement clients for these things as well, that you should not recall this, right? When it comes back with a 400, the client should be smart enough to say, no, this kind of error I'm not actually supposed to repeat, right? I need to make a change of some kind, whether that's asking the client or asking some, you know, real user to make a change or whether I need to make a change programmatically or something like that. But whatever I've just attempted to do, just never going to work. Just not going to happen. 403, forbidden. You've asked me something. I understand what you asked me, but no, not really going to do that, right? Um, you should not repeat this without modification. Most often done um, around... Uh, authentication and authorization, right? It's possible that you literally do not have permission to do something like this. You're forbidden from doing it. 404, not found. Stop asking me. There's nothing here. 406, not acceptable. This is really interesting because we're going to talk about it in, in another couple of slides is this idea that um, just because a client asks the server for something doesn't mean that the server can honor that request. Even if programmatically they could do everything that the server wants, there's no way for them to communicate back to the original caller some piece of information. So what you've said is, I really want to help you, but I can't, right? I don't have enough information to give you what you need. 409 conflict, we're going to see the use of this one. The resource is in a state that conflicts with this particular request. So the client should attempt to rectify the conflict in some way. This is significantly different from, you know, what we saw earlier where do not repeat without modification. This basically says that everything you've done is right, but the system's in a state that I can't really handle this for you right now. So what you actually need to do is do some other work. That may be more requests against the server, and then you can come back and fix this up, right? This will this will work for you. So let's take a look at some rep response statuses. Okay, so we'll go back to our create method here, right? A little bit earlier. Uh, the create method, we said, needs to return a particular response status. Anybody remember what it needs to be? Should it be 200? Uh, 201, right? Create it, right? Because we are actually creating something. But th when we choose to do that, what sort of always comes along with it? What did we say? Location, yeah. So it's easy enough to say, perhaps, return new and springs parlance. It's a response entity. And one of the things you can put in a response entity is HTTP status dot created. And let me fix this guy up here. So now, Very unhappy about that. Oh, response status, right. There we go. So now we can basically say, yes, create it. But we can also then, uh, we need to put location in here. And that's going to come in the headers. We don't know how yet. So we're going to hand back those headers, right? So this is one way of basically saying, using a spring-specific type, 
here's what I want the response entity to look like. And this response entity type, you know, I've put void in there so nothing has to go in, but it could hold a game if you want to hand back the entire payload of the game when it went back, stuff like that. <clears throat> but in our particular case, we don't want that. All we want is the location to go back. So that's one way of setting the response status. Let's take a look at another kind of response status. Legal transition exception. So, <clears throat> inside of the game service, there's a possibility that you could ask me to do something that I cannot do, right? You ask me to open a door first thing. Not allowed to do that. You ask me to open a door that's already open. Can't really do that. You ask me to select a door that's already been selected or selected after another one's open. There are many, many different things that might happen, state changes you're asking me for, that I can't actually support, right? So, when those happen, we throw an illegal transition exception, and that comes out, uh, I don't actually know what it comes out as, but let's say it comes out as a 500 or something like that, right? It's a server error, something has gone wrong. But we want to be more descriptive than that, right? So we said that there are a number of different return codes. Uh, in our particular case, what we're going to say is that we're in conflict. You've asked me to do something, I've understood what you've asked me to do, but I can't actually do that. Right? It's, it's the state of the system will not allow me to do that. So, in the case of exceptions that are getting returned, one of the things that you can do is annotate them. And simply say, response status, and the response status should be conflict. Right? So now, whenever that exception is actually thrown and percolates all the way through the spring stack, it's going to come out the other end and spring's going to go, oh, I understand that exception. I'm going to turn that into a conflict, right? Anybody remember what that is? I think it's 406. I deal with the, the types, so, you know, sort of the rich types so often I forget what these numbers are. <laughs> but good developers will immediately ask, what? What if you don't have that exception? Right? What, if, what if I can't change an exception? Like a great example is something like an illegal argument exception. And so what you can do in that case in Spring is simply use what's called an exception handler. Exception handle, oops, yeah. handling. No, that's not what it's called. What did I call it? Error handling. Here we go. All right. This is basically a way for us to say that given an exception, if it's thrown out because I can't go and annotate a type that's, you know, a JRE type, but I do want to do the same kind of thing. I want you to notice that this kind of exception has come out, and I want you to um, uh, convert it to a particular kind of response. And so we saw like the case where um, game controller. We saw the game controller here where we, for example, assert that it's not null. If you've asked me for a game that doesn't exist, we're going to throw an illegal argument exception. This argument is wrong. And we need to convert that. And so we say, exception handler, and we describe what kind of exception? Illegal argument exception. And we want to map that to a particular response status, which uh, I cannot remember what it is, not found. Right, something like that. And so now whenever Spring sees an illegal argument exception come by, it's going to automatically turn that into a 404, not found for us. Go ahead and run some tests. See if we're any closer to getting this to, to run properly. Ooh, four this time, right? Okay. <clears throat> okay. Hypermedia as the engine of application state. God, this is a bad acronym, right? <laughs> um, HATOs, maybe? I sort of think of it as very angry Cheerios. I don't know. Uh, there is no real good pronunciation for it, so pick your own. We'll all figure out eventually what it's going to be called. This is the idea that the client doesn't actually have any built-in knowledge of how to navigate and manipulate the model. We said we want to decouple the client from the server so that we are free to change the server without requiring lockstep changes on the client, right? 
we're building these RESTful APIs, these huge things that are going to be used by millions of users on millions of different versions of, of our particular application. Maybe if you're Google and people have gone nuts for mashups, you have no idea what they're going to actually do. So what we want is for the server to dynamically add that information in the payloads that are sent to the user. And we do this by using something called media types and link relations. So what we can do is so, so what we can do is say, I as a server know how to make some things, right? I know how to make um, XML, I know how to make JSON, I know how to make this other kind of pro uh, protocol, something like that. And the client says, oh, I know what I can handle. I can handle some HTML, I can handle some plain text, I can handle some JSON as well. And the client then tells the server what it can accept. The server says, okay, let's match that list against my list in a process called content negotiation, and then hands that back, right? And there are a couple of headers that go along with this, the accept header from the client side saying what you can accept, and then the content type header, which is used primarily by the server going back to the, user, back to the client saying, here's what I'm providing you, but obviously if a user is pushing data to us, we need to know as well, and so they'll use content type as well. Then we have these link relations, right? has no idea. We've given it one well-known URL. We've given the client that one well-known URL, and it needs to be able to get to a particular game. It needs to be able to get to the doors of the game. And it does this with links. And you guys have seen links like this already. Anybody who's ever seen a single HTML page has seen one of these HeyToS links. It has two particular parts, a rel or a relation, and an href, the URL at that relation. And so we have this idea of I, if I want to find the doors, I go to the doors relation, and it is particularly located here. And so, there's a project, of course there's a project, it's the Spring Portfolio, that helps us do that. So we set up here, <coughs> at to-do number eight, that we need to tell our users about the um, about the game that was actually created. And we could do something like headers.set location URI create HTTP localhost 8080 and immediately that's wrong because you've got no idea where it's going to run so you're going to have to go find somewhere else what it is. Maybe it's just you know, slash game slash, you know, plus something like that, but that sucks, right? Because who knows if the application's always gonna be at slash games. It might be at slash game, if you're one of the singular kind of people. It may be at slash my app slash game, or something like that. So instead, what we wanna actually do is use this. Let's see if I can remember how to convince this guy to work right. Link two. This is a static method provided by um, Spring HeyToS and allows us to say, take a look at this game controller class that I've created. Right? If you look at that, what I think you'll find is all of the mapping information I could possibly need. Right? It says that it needs to be at slash games. And then from there, I want dot slash, and I'm going to put in the game that I just created. It's a type called identifiable, which basically means it has an ID. You could just as easily say get ID, right? Because um, you need the ID to go in there. So you start reading this. Start with game controller, whatever URL game controller provides us, slash the game ID, and then turn that into a URI for me. Bang. All done. Right? But we might want to do something somewhere else. So we take a look at something a little bit more detailed than that. And that's in this game resource assembler. Again, another Spring Hey2S abstraction. It basically says, mm, excuse me, given a game, which has, you know, we put some annotations in it, we're using Jackson to do JSON, uh, yeah, to do JSON serialization in it. So it's gonna turn all of the bits and pieces, you know, all the property status and stuff like that in there. It's gonna convert all that right. But it doesn't have this idea of links because links are sort of a, a web tier kind of construct. So we want to add them in there. And we see one to start with. What we do is we create this resource type, which is just sort of a generic holder of things. And we add the game to it. So now our resource has a game and all of its stuff in it. We want to add some links. In this particular case, we added a self link. And a self link is sort of always, always um, added to a payload. 
when, when you're sort of following H2S principles. And that is sort of a unique and canonical, that's the key, canonical identifier of this particular resource. Because it is perfectly reasonable for resources to be accessible at different URIs on the internet. They can have two or three or five or ten different representations, but one of them is the truth. And so we generally have self to indicate what the truth is, just a well-known rel that's always used. But we also want to add some other payload objects, right? Or sorry, some other link objects, because it's not sufficient for us just to know where the game is. We also need to know where the doors are as well. So inside of our loop where we iterate over the doors, add link to no either of those uh, where is it door controller dot class okay door controller dot class now if we take a look at the door controller we're going to see that this isn't quite going to work because at the door controller level, we actually have to pass in what the game is, right? Because it's slash games, then the game ID, and then slash doors, and, slash, and then the doors ID. So we can pass in the game itself, and then, which acts as an argument. And this is sort of a var args thing, so if you had multiple placeholders in that particular URL, you just pass them all in. Slash the door that we want to do, and then we want to create a link with a rel called door. Okay, give that a run of the tests, see if we can get down below four now. Not sure we get another one this one this time. Oh, yep, three. So now if we took a look at this payload, there would be three individual links, all with a rel of door and a value or an href value, that is, this URL. And it gives us the ability, since we're pointing at the door controller, to simply change the door controller's mapping, and implicitly, the links will change as well. It's very, very flexible in this way, right? You're not sort of um, calcifying into a particular URI scheme. If you want to change it, you still have the ability to. And that's key. We're going to see in the demo at the end the ability to if by following H2S principles like this and decoupling the client and the server, we're going to see that you can just change that URL at will because the, because the client only knows the top level and does link traversal to find everything else. <clears throat> and so, the final step of any good implementation, testing. Testing of web APIs, not easy, right? You can do in-container testing. End to end, right? You got databases on one end. You've got the entire Spring Stack that does all of your um, uh, request routing and type conversion. You've got Jackson in there turning JSON payloads in uh, out and stuff like that. But at the other end of it, you're probably running some string comparisons to make sure certain strings show up inside of your JSON payloads, and it's slow, not great. On the flip side, you might do out of container testing. So you might actually instantiate a new copy of your um, of your controller. Um, you're going to pass it the Java objects that it actually wants to. You probably got some mocks sitting on the backside. The key here is it bypasses a lot of Spring's magic, right? Uh, Spring is great because it does so much for you, but if you're testing a controller by calling a method, you have no idea if Spring's actually going to route that request properly. So you haven't really tested the web layer there either. So ideally what we want is tests that are out of container for speed, but with as much of the Spring magic in them as possible. And so Spring has added this. This is not new in 4. This was new in 3.1, 3.2, something like that, but not many people have seen it. It bootstraps most of Spring's MVC infrastructure. For the purposes of this discussion, certainly, it, it bootstraps all of Spring's uh, MVC infrastructure so that you can both unit and integration test exercise of the application, so you can either sort of mock out behind the controller if you want to, but still get the spring stack above the controller, or you can have it instantiate the entire application context and just go bang, 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 and make requests against it. And it provides APIs for doing interesting kinds of testing of requests and responses. Uh, 
about wearing here might I find a to do? Oh, there we go. Okay, so I'm doing the sort of full integration test style. Um, it's relatively quick to do. Uh, obviously, there is a delay. Uh, the way Spring integration test generally works is that it bootstraps your application context once for all of your tests uh, and just reuses it. So you sort of pay a one-time penalty and then can test uh, all of your controllers at roughly unit test kinds of speeds. Um, and what we see here is that we can take this mock MVC object um, which, which we get a hold of, and we can do some things with a Fluent API. So in this particular case, we're testing uh, what it takes to read a game that has been created. So we want to perform something. We want to perform a get, where we say we want to go to games, game ID, doors, door ID. We pass those in. And we want to expect that the status that it returns is okay. If it's not okay, then we've got a problem here. But we want to do some other things as well, right? It's not simply enough to test that we've gotten the proper status code back. We also need to test that the payloads are okay. And in the case of JSON payloads, there is a project called JSON Path. Has anybody used JSON Path of any kind? Yeah, a little bit. It's good to see. More people should know about it. JSON Path um, originally came out of the JavaScript community and is a syntax that is supposed to be similar to XPath not sure why anybody would make that a goal, but it is, um, for describing uh, a traversal through a JSON uh, object. And we see some complicated ones below. In this particular case, what we want to say is, given the return, the response from this, we want to execute a JSON path expression against it. We want to check the content of this particular door, and we expect its value to be unknown. And we see other things, such as the status, making sure that it's closed. You can get super complicated, right? Go into the links body, take a look at all of the links that have a rel of self, uh, find the href associated with them. Since this could potentially return more than one of them, you need the first index off of it, and its value should be this big complicated thing right here, right? So it can get as simple or as complex as you need it to be, but you can test exactly what's in there without worrying like, that the ordering of all of the keys inside of your JSON payload is always consistent. That, man, that drives me nuts because I love sets. You know, mathematically they're uh, very precise in what they mean, but it means that things are totally unordered and it's a giant pain in the butt to try and test them. Hopefully we get some tests. I, it's pretty clear that I have actually screwed up the implementation since we still have uh, <laughs> one test failure in here. Um, yeah, so that's not great. That means I have done something wrong. Um, rather than bore you guys with trying to figure out where I made my implementation failure, I am going to get reset hard, <laughs> bring us back to everything that it should be, <laughs> uh, and hopefully give another run to this and it will work. Come on, Loki. Don't come, to, don't come this time. Huzzah, all test passed. Don't you wish all programming was that easy? <laughs> so, now that we've got this, we've designed it, we've implemented it, we've used return codes, we've used HOS to make sure that we can traverse between all these different things, let's go ahead and use this API, right? Goals, single URL, get that link traversal, content negotiation, make sure everybody's dealing with the proper kinds of payloads. And because uh, in my current capacity, I am actually a Ruby developer most days, um, we're going to take a look at this in Ruby. Don't anybody freak out uh, the way Ruby developers always do when they see Java. What little babies. <laughs> um, fundamentally, it's exactly what you think. We post to create a new game. We get the status of the doors. Uh, we print that state out. We update the door. We open a door at the end, we say we want it to be opened, and we delete it and clean it up. If we take a look in here, in this implementation, there's only one URL in the entire thing, right? It's this guy right here that says game root, the top point that we're, we're aiming at. But everything else is like this. We iterate through all of the links. This is a closure for those of you guys who have <laughs> not yet seen Java 8. Um, and it grabs out the href from the one that matches in this particular case, door, but we might take a look at some other ones and it prints the whole thing out. So, bundle exec. 
Awaiting initial selection. What door should I pick? Give me a number between zero and two. One. Okay. So we've selected door number one. They've opened door zero for us and told us there's a small furry animal back there. So what door do we open now? Two. Oh, you guys aren't very good. Now we've lost. That's not awesome. So let's try it one more time. Let's see if we can get a win on the second time. If only they allowed you to do this in the, uh, <laughs> on the game show. Ha ha! When I don't take your advice, I win. I, there's, a, there's a lesson here, right? <laughs> so this is pretty cool, right? It means that we've used a completely separate language. We've had one URL endpoint, and we've managed to do something, something useful with it. But what I think is um, uh, really great is the fact that we could come in here. Because of that, we could come in here and say... Uh, right, I want the door controller, and instead of doors, we might instead want this to say door. You know, I probably should have actually demoed this. So let's go ahead and restart the server real quick. Let's start up. You can see we're running uh, Spring Boot here, um, which makes things nice and self-contained. And of course, there's already uh, something on the given socket. No, I don't want it to debug. Well, that's part of the problem. Come on. Yeah, okay. So it's not going to play ball with me today. Um, clearly, I have something still running uh, elsewhere in the system taking up that particular port. Actually, I wonder if I can get away with... Um You can see that I make mistakes like this enough that I have a, a whole alias dedicated to getting rid of all of the Java things that are running in all of these places. One last try. Yes, good. And so now, if everything goes properly, maybe. Yes. Now clearly, I've changed the URL that it's going to, but it's still gone to and found the status of all of the doors. And win again without your help. And without your help. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> so Roundup. Uh, the thing I can't stress enough about this is API design matters, right? Going sort of organically and adding a thing here and a verb there and a, a media type in this other place sort of as you go, uh, it's agile, but it's not always the greatest way to do it, right? sitting down and identifying the use cases that consumers are going to have for your, for, your, for your API is really, really important. Sometimes that's really easy. Sometimes you control most of the clients. Other times you're, you're Google and you have no idea what the clients are going to do. And each one of those requires a different way of thinking about how your API is going to be designed, how much the payload should include versus linking to. Basically, the old... Uh, the old trade-off when you're designing database schemas, how much to normalize, how much to denormalize, what the, what the what, uh, you know, sort of good endpoints are that, that coalesce other things versus being able to hit each piece individually. Thinking about that up front makes using an API, you know, so much better than if it just sort of evolves over time. Make sure that the URIs you have represent resources, not actions. Big deal, right? Resources are nouns. Nouns not verbs, because you've got HTTP verbs to do everything you need to do, right? The HTTP verbs are relatively general, with the exception of post that basically allows you to do any damn thing you want. Implementation isn't rocket science. Ev almost every single person in this room raised their hand and said, I am a Spring MVC user. I have written Spring MVC controllers. What you saw today was primarily Spring MVC controllers. You can take a look um, uh, at the code in my GitHub repository, there's a link for it um, on the next page uh, for anybody that didn't see it on the first one. And you can see that there's nothing special there. The only special thing probably that you're going to see is Spring Hate OS, which is a really, really nice library that automates the creation of these, these resources. Not East testing. Uh, <laughs> um, ease testing should be what that says. Uh, out of container, but a full spring stack, right? We know that we've wired in the routes properly. We know that uh, Jackson is getting involved in serializing our objects and all of the, the links are made correctly and stuff like that. So that's a nice thing that we get for testing. And so finally, some Q&A, right? Any questions on what you guys have seen here today?
Yeah, right up there. Right, so the question is when it's useful to write your own controller like we saw versus when it's interesting to write Spring Data REST. Um, if what you, uh, Spring Data REST for anybody who doesn't know is basically a project that creates all of the CRUD endpoints you need for a particular type. Uh, it's a great project, right? And many of the endpoints we did today probably actually um, duplicate what Spring Data REST may have provided me. The answer is sort of, it depends on what your application is. For me, adding Spring Data REST is adding yet another dependency that I didn't need for the purposes of this demo application. But if your, applica but if your endpoints are primarily CRUD endpoints of full entities that you have persisted you know, via JPA, Spring Data REST is an absolutely great idea because the best code is code you didn't write, right? Yeah. Another one here. Yeah, so the question is, in addition to using links so that we can decouple um, clients from servers, we can use custom media types. In this particular case, we didn't go into it too deeply, but I basically said that everything needed to be application JSON. And that works to a point. Um, and in fact, my views on this have evolved quite a bit over the last couple of years. I used to be a, certainly a fan of the most generic thing you can possibly do. But as time goes on, it becomes pretty clear that you have to version RESTful APIs. And in the case of versioning RESTful APIs, it is very, very helpful to have media types that are more specific than simply, this is a JSON payload, right? And so it'd be very common for someone to say that this is um, an application slash uh, DevOps dot door dot V1 or something like that. And so that basically gives us the ability for, um, uh, a user to instead to, to ask us, say, I will accept either version one of door or version two of door or version three of door kind of thing, or I only know how to handle and parse two and one, or you might have a server that says I can only provide two and I can't provide one or vice versa kind of thing. So I would say that in general, more precise versions are better. It allows you to version each and every entity's representation um, individually. Uh, the trade-off is, of course, that it becomes much, much more complex, right? Um, it means that a user has to know when they make a call exactly what the type needs to be. A lot of that comes down to documentation, but my experience has pushed me for anything that is reasonably sophisticated to take, take the hit on that level of complexity because it pays off uh, over time. Yeah, is there a question in front of you? Yeah, there you go. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, so the question is, if you're using a binding result object, right, somebody is actually sending a form back or something like that, how does that um, work in this particular case? This is primarily, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? RESTful endpoints are primarily stateless, right? That means that the idea of a binding result or a binding result object doesn't make a whole lot of sense because it has this idea that something came in, uh, something has been pushed out to the user, form has been populated, data has been sent in, it's been validated and stuff like that. You might be returning that validated data back to them saying it's not right. It doesn't work in a lot of cases, but there's no reason technically it doesn't work, right? In the, the way that I bound in a game, you could you could run the validation that you expect to do there. You don't have to bind in sort of uh, the help you get from spring data instead. You can just make your binding result object one of the arguments that comes into your RESTful methods. And it'll, it should just work right. I, I don't have any experience with that, but from what I know of spring, I have no reason to doubt that that'll just work the way you expect it to. Yeah. One last question, anybody? Yeah, right up here. Yeah, so the, the question is, um, is it possible to make links relative? Yeah, anything's possible, right? <laughs> everything, is, everything is right in REST. Uh, but in practice, it is not wise to do so. Um, fully qualified domains, or sorry, fully qualified URLs, all the way out to the protocol and everything, are the way, generally. Because it's, uh, if you are just making a RESTful call, it's not always obvious that 
where that the next link is going to be on the same domain and use the same protocol, right? It may possibly switch you over to HTTPS from HTTP. It may go to a more canonical server than sort of this C named domain you're currently on. So because of that, it's almost always, uh, it's, it's generally accepted that what needs to actually happen is you need to have a fully qualified URL at all times. Yeah. Okay, everybody. Thank you. Have a good day.